Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Dr. Music Podcast. Today, sitting in with me is Mr. Ron Polson. Uh, Ron is the bassist for Pangea, a classic progressive rock band uh, and more uh, that formed as Artica in 1989. And in 91, they would change their name to Pangea. The band celebrating 35 years in music. Uh, they took a 15-year hiatus somewhere in there, but they are back to celebrate 35 years, and that is a feat uh, for sure. Uh, they have a new record called Beowulf. It is now available on HMG Records. Ron's here to tell us all about it. Welcome, Ron. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, now there's going to be some folks here. Uh, we'll go over the timeline because I think that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, it's that gap of, of 15 years. It's a long time. Uh, so, you know, I would imagine there are some interesting things happen in those years. Uh, but uh, there's some folks here that don't know Pangea music. Uh, and, you know, I have my own way that I would describe it, uh, and I don't know if that's accurate, you do so much. Uh, how would you describe the sound of the band? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what the way I look at it, and you can tell me if you think that it's accurate. Um, we, we kind of always go for the, it, to me, when I listen to it, it's a mix of like Asia and Pink Floyd. That's what, that's what, when people ask me what, what, what we sound like, that's what I always say. But we, we really take our, our, you know, our direction from the 70s prog, like EOP, King Crimson, UK, uh, Rush, Pink Floyd, obviously, yes. You know, that's, that's kind of what we, uh, that's where we would lump ourselves if we were asked what we, what we were supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, and I would do the same, uh, for sure. But I hear, you know, like I say, I hear so much more. I hear, uh, you know, even a little bit of The Who uh, in there, and I hear The Beatles, uh, ELO, um, you know, more on that pop uh, side of, you know, maybe a progressive pop thing. Um, you know, ELO and ELP all in one box and an all-in-one composition is a beautiful beautiful thing and i love what you do uh it's great uh let's get to the timeline uh 2008 you you play a big show you you know you're doing well uh and the band goes silent uh what puts the band what puts halt to the band and in 2023 you get started again what was the catalyst for that so take us through that a little bit so so you're kind of dating ourselves a little bit there, but uh, it's kind of it's kind of a bummer. It's kind of depressing, but you know you can't you can't cry over spilled milk. So what happened was just it's, we just like to say it's life. You know, a uh, couple of us got married, had kids. You know, I have three daughters. Uh, guys went to school. Guys' careers got in you know, not in the way, but you know you have to pay your bills. Kind of thing. So the, all that kind of took us out for a while. Um, what got us back together was the fact that we. You know, we're brothers and we're in this together till the end. And we'd, we'd always talked and we'd always over the years like, man, we really need to do this. And that was pretty much it. And I guess one day the, the story I get from Corey was there was a version of Pangea with another singer and bass player. And he just I guess he had just had enough. And he he was driving home one day and he called those two guys and like, you're fired. And he called Steve and I and said, man, we're doing it. And and that was we, we'd been talking about trying to do it and we never just really could get there. And then I guess one day we all were just like, it's going to have to happen. So we met in Dallas and when we met, we were thinking, yeah, maybe we get back together. We learned some of the old songs. Maybe we'll get lucky and we'll, we'll play a show, but we didn't know. I mean, we could have got back in that room and, and started playing and it could, it could have sucked and we could have just been like, no, we're not going to do this. But we had a we had a set list and we had X amount of songs. You're like, let's just try to get through a couple of them. Well, we got through them. Well, let's try to get through a couple more. Well, we got a couple more. And, you know, we got three albums worth of music to try to get through. I'm not saying we got through all three albums, but we got through a lot more than we thought we were going to get through. And so we're like, okay, let's just try to practice more. Let's try to play. And then in the mix of that, of trying to just practice and play, one of the guys is like, maybe we should go out to Roberts and do another album, you know, and you know how the room gets silent and everybody kind of looks around each other. Somebody's like, well, I have some songs. And, and Steve's like, well, I got songs. And Andy's like, well, I got songs. And it's like, and next thing you know, we got another album. So it's just, it, and a website. And, you know, I think when we, when we got together a few years ago, 
none of us were expecting this, uh, you know, all the things that have come together, but man, they really came together and it's, we're, we're very blessed, very fortunate. Good people like you giving us their time. We've had a lot of interviews and, and things are just, if things keep going the way they're going, it's going to knock on wood. It's going to be really good. Uh, that's that is so great to hear because i do love what you do and uh you know and i am a guy who's who's lived life uh you know i have a son and a daughter myself uh you know i've moved i've gotten married uh you know there's that middle portion i know you know we used to go to you know baby showers and uh you know uh, um bachelor parties and things like that and now it's a little more funerals, you know, <laughs> unfortunately. So, you know, there's that life progression and that middle portion, like you're saying, you know, uh, buying a house, moving, kids, uh, jobs, um, you know, getting cemented in your in your life is a responsibility that, you know, not too many people can bypass. So, you know, we get it. We get it out here for sure. <laughs> For us too, I don't, I don't know how many people know or really, but like Corey and Andy and I have all known each other from school since we were, uh, Andy was in junior high. So, I mean, we're like, we're kind of more like brothers at the end of the day than, you know, most people, all of us, all of us actually are. And then when Corey went to junior college, he met Steve and Daryl. So we've known each other forever. And, and we may not have talked every day, you know, and been like, close family, but we always, we've always kept in touch. And and so it's, it's like now it's more like a, I don't know, like a family reunion kind of a thing and, and the long brother finding each other kind of thing. And, and it's, you know, it is about the music, but even more, more, it's about the camaraderie, you know, and, and being around each other and being together and being able to like experience things together. Uh, like we played a show here not long ago and, we all went and ate lunch together and stuff like that at some little restaurant off the side of the road, you know, it's things like that, getting to do all the little stuff. That's the kind of stuff that makes it all worth it. You know, at the end of the day, man, that is, that's so great. That is so great. Uh, Yeah. And that's really a living the dream thing uh, when you can do it with people you love like that. Yeah. that's great. Uh, you know, when you got back together, you you change as people. Uh, you know, things change. All those material things change, but maybe your thinking changes. Maybe your playing changes. Uh, you know, you learn a few more things, or you forget a few more things. Uh, when you got back together, uh, the band dynamic, or any was there anything specific that seemed to have changed? Maybe somebody was writing different, or had changed their style a little bit. Anything like that? No, I don't think, I, I mean, I think if you listen to Beowulf and you listen to our first three albums, I don't think it's too much of a, a departure from what we had been doing in the past. Um, Corby has stacks and stacks of notebooks with songs in them. And, uh, you know, we could be recording for the rest of our lives, to be honest with you. And um, some of the stuff that's on this album is is brand, brand new, like fresh, like, like literally weeks before we go in the studio. I mean, it, you know, it's... And, you know, but tomorrow will come, uh, uh, without you is a song that we've been playing for a very, very, very long time. So, you know, and you've got songs on there that Steve wrote, Andy wrote, and then, you know, a lot of stuff that Corey wrote. So it's just um, it's just kind of more like a continuation of what we've been doing in the past. It's just kind of we took a break. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's that's amazing. Uh, you know, like I say, because, you know, people change, uh, you know, styles change, things like that. But to, to, to stay on course uh, through that is, is really a great thing. Uh, you mentioned Robert. Uh, and we're going to talk about Robert Berry, uh, you know, Greg Kinn, Keith Emerson, GTR. He's a producer, mixer, uh, engineer. The guy does it all. He's a musician as well. Uh, um, he's been with you since about 1996. Uh, he returns to that role. You know, he takes the hiatus with you guys and comes right back as part of the part of the family. It seems. Uh, tell me about Robert. What he brings to the table for the band, um, and you know his his role really. I know he produces, mixes, engineers the album. Does he write with you? Does he play on on the record with you? What what is the significance of Robert in the in the Pangea uh, format here? 
So Robert, Robert is actually like kind of like a brother. Um, so to, to at the very start, when when we were Artica, we did a little four song EP just with uh, Daryl, myself, uh, Andy and Corey. And that was we did that here in, in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, actually at a little studio called the 25th track that a guy named Walt Bowers owned. And uh, so our friend here in town, uh, Paul Clark, actually knew Robert. So he sent him the CD. So we're, we had, we all had the three CD before Robert even knew who we were. We were nerd. We were fans of him before he even knew who we were. <laughs> it's our, our CD. And he's like, Hey, before we went out and did the rite of passage, he's like, you guys come out here, spend like three or four days. We'll take two or three of your songs. We'll take them apart and we'll put them back together. He goes, if you think it's trash, you don't ever have to come back out here again. He's like, but if you like it, he goes, you know, or he goes, at least at the end of the day, you got a pretty good like little demo cassette out of it or something like that. So we get in there with them. We, we get our little demo. We go out in the van after we're done. We stick it in. And it's dead silence, and we're all looking at each other, and we're all just like, "Oh my God!" You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when when you go to Roberts, and I've said this many times in some of the interviews that I've done lately, and I'll say it again, it's like it's like going to a four year music college in two weeks because he he can teach you stuff in five minutes that most professors will probably not be able to teach you in four years of instruction, you know, at a at a music college. Um, he. Of course, he's a bass player and I'm a bass player. So, I mean, you know, like this last time I was out there, I saw a Rickenbacker hanging up in the back corner and I was like, well, that'd be cool. And I go to pick it up and it's got, it says Chris Squire, like written in Sharpie on there. And I'm like, and I kind of, I let go of it. And I was like, I was like, hey man, I think Chris Squire signed that bass. You know, I'm like, uh, it's, that's, that's like his studio. Every, everything is, it's amazing. I mean, so even not being there all that time, right? I, I said something about this earlier. I walked in, I put my backpack down, gave him a hug, walked over, picked up the bass, he hit play, and we started. Just like it was just wow. like it was you know, yesterday, and we had never, we never, you know, not seen each other. It's just that it's that seamless. Um, in the beginning, I will tell you that yeah, he he kind of did, you know, on the first album, uh, take the songs apart. Uh, this key isn't stressing out Daryl's vocal enough, so we need to change it. This part's way too long. Take it out. Um, why don't we try this here? You know, but I'll tell you that as time progressed and as we got to Beowulf, we Andy bought Pro Tools and put it. He's got it in a studio there in studio in Houston. So we had pretty much everything done. Like I would fly down and do the bass part. So all the rough draft stuff went to Robert before we got out there. So anything that we needed to change would have been fixed or done before we even got out there to do Beowulf. So this album, we walked in, I would say there was a couple, maybe minor little changes, but nothing like in the past. So I think that the story there is that we've all grown as songwriters, musicians, arrangers, producers on our own right. And a lot of that credit has to go to Robert. You know, to yeah. that beginning, he taught us how you do it kind of a thing, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's amazing. You know, like I said, 10 minutes with him is like, you know, four years in a music college because he can just, you don't do this, you do this. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, it's just that kind of every time. You know, so, And the crazy thing is he can, he'll be talking to somebody else and you'll be playing and you don't think like he's paying attention to what you're doing. <laughs> you're not right. And he'll, he'll, the tape will just automatically stop and he'll turn around and goes, no, nope. and he'll rewind it and he goes, do it again. He, he just know, he, can hear, he hears what all everybody's doing wow. just like that. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, yeah, super talented guy I know from, you know, other things that he's done as well. Uh, he's just that, you know, in that six by six project that he's doing with Ian Crichton and uh, Nigel Glockler. Uh <laughs> Of our favorite nerd bands in saga nerd out there. <laughs> yeah yeah uh just crazy uh you know i have jim gilmore on the show a long time ago and uh just it, it was a thrill to to you know like you say you, you nerd out with uh with bands like that and uh you know to, to, for him to do another project like that is uh you know it's, it's, it's that's what this is all about you know uh you know having all this great music around and uh 
you know, for him to be involved with what you're doing is is really a gift to to, to me and the fan for sure. Uh, you know, it's great. For us, because he's just such. And the thing is, he it's not like he's. And you know, Corey said this a million times. It's not like I'm Robert Barry. You know, he. You know, I've done this. I've done. It. He will never. He'll never name drop you. He'll never. Hey, I'm better at this than you are. Let me have that, and I'll do it. And it's not. He turns around and he's like, "Do it like this," you know. And then he lets you do it, you know. So he's teaching you along the way. It's like the best big brother you could ask for, really. <laughs> yeah, it's so cool. It's it's yeah. great. It's great. Um, let's get into some songs. Uh, Tomorrow will come is the first single. Uh, I think it's perfect for to represent the band. Uh, it's it's really radio it's probably the most radio friendly of of the songs um and you know you guys do so much more you know <laughs> yeah that 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 terrible phrase radio friendly uh, <laughs> but it's but it does you do what you do uh as well and it highlights a lot of you know the instrumentation and the vocal is great uh production is fantastic on it of course um it's uplifting and it's positive uh what is the writing process for you guys when when you're writing? I noticed that there there is a writing credit for everybody on this song. Uh, is that does it change? Has it changed over the years? Was it like that in the beginning? Uh, you know, has everybody come to the table with something? I, I would say in the beginning it was more Corey because it was his baby. You know what I mean? And, right. and then a lot of the the bigger. And, the anthemic like prog songs that we have were Corey's and, and in the beginning it was like this is the part this is how I want you to play it and this is how we played it kind of a thing now I will tell you coming to this album um so Corey I don't know if you know but Corey's a, a professor of music he actually teaches music at a college here and, okay. and, and so um everything that we do he has written out and Corey's kind of like Robert in that way too if you're not getting something or Hey man, in this key, what's this with, you know, he, he just knows he can, you know, okay, this is this, it's got this many sharps, this many flat, you know, let me show you how this works kind of thing. So, so he's kind of like that as well. Um, and, but Corey would, on this album, my, my point was he, he had everything written out, charted out, all the music's there. We go in because, because I'll, I'll pretty much read what Corey has. When, when we started recording, you know, I was like, well, I didn't play everything or maybe I played more. I played things that weren't written or, or things that, you know, were written. I didn't play. And, and we just in the studio at the moment felt that it was better. So on this, on this, because what happened was we come back after doing recording and we started rehearsing and I'm playing like it's written on the paper and we're all like, well, that's not the way it sounds on the CD. And it's like, yeah, because that's not the way. And then you have to go back and listen and go, wait a minute, I didn't play all that stuff. But it didn't need it. And it's okay. You know, and Corey is much more now, hey, here's an idea. Or Andy, even with like Wasape, or Steve with Masquerade, you know, here's an idea. Here's the shell. You guys go do your thing. You know, yeah. it's not like, it's not like, you know, Steve would, would put, you know, Masquerade up there and say, you know, Daryl, you've got to play this guitar part just this way. You know, he's like, here it is. You do your thing. So, you know, this album is much more open to, I guess, the each musician's interpretation of what they think should have been there kind of a thing. Yeah. Or in the past, it was kind of more, it was kind of more set. You know, this is okay. the way it's going to be kind of a thing. So, right. Yeah. yeah. And we've, that's. We've grown, we've grown, I guess, as musicians and as we growed up a little bit, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, and it's great. I love having everybody's take on the part. Uh, you know, it's not as rigid. It's not as sterile. Uh, you can feel that. You can feel that warmth in the music, uh, for sure. And, you know, everything is is jiving together. It's, uh, you know, it, it happens. You know, yeah. it, it's cool. Yeah. Um, when I hear the Beowulf album, I, you know, like we were talking about, I was reminded of the classic iconic bands, the Yes, the uh, Rush, uh, you know, I hear Xanadu at the beginning of Masquerade, uh, you know, the, a little bit of Pinball Wizard with that acoustic guitar kind of thing, when, you know, um, all of those Asian dream theater even, um, you know, it gets to that point. Uh, but also, you know, like in the single, uh, Tomorrow Will Come, I, I 
hear that Beatles pop sensibility, uh, the ELO the influence there. Um, anyone in the band that comes from a different world of influence, possibly? Uh, is there somebody that's a, you know, a, okay, a classical or a jazz or a funk or something like that? I was going to tell you why, what got me into music is that uh, I had a buddy that lived two houses over from me and he got the Kiss Destroyer album. And his mom wouldn't let him keep it because she thought it was demonic. So he gave me the album. And once I put it on, I thought I was Ace Freely and I was going to be Ace, right? So I saved up 200 bucks and I bought a cheap Hondo Les Paul copy. And then that, that's what I was in, you know. And uh, my uncle gave me a bass and Corey and I obviously knew each other. And he's like, in high school, he's like, man, I'm, I got a band and I'm playing guitar and and I was like, well, I got a bass. I guess we're in, we're in a band together. And then, you know, Andy had a drum set in his room. So the, the rest is kind of a little bit of history there. But um, Corey's got very uh, more classical kind of influences in his stuff. Uh, I would think, you know, Daryl, our guitar player, is more of like a, uh, he's very heavily influenced by Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top and David Gilmore yeah. from Pink Floyd. I think when you listen to his guitar playing, you can kind of get those two mixes together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, me in the beginning, uh, if you'd asked me who my three favorite bass players were in the, when I started playing, it would have been Steve Harris from Iron Maiden, Billy Sheehan, and Gene Simmons. Those were the three guys that if they did it, I bought it pretty much yeah. when I was in high school, right? And, um, you know, we all, even like Andy, when he, when he first, you know, started getting into music, he was more in a country. You know, so we all, Steve's kind of in the country, you know, so we all have different, you know, pulls and all that kind of stuff. And Corey was the first person that introduced me to Asia. I wasn't really, I didn't, you know, so he's right. like, you need to listen to this, you know, or Survivor. I wasn't really listening to Survivor unless they had like a hit on the radio. But right. Corey was like, why don't you listen to the rest of the album, you know, kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, which gets you into, into people like the cars and stuff like, you know, of those generation, that kind of stuff. And so and then and then the whole, you know, I might have dabbled in the prog a little bit, but I never really got into it. Do you start listening to bands like UK and the really weird like King Crimson stuff and stuff like that? And it's kind of like it's really out there. Right. You know, but then Emerson Lake and Palmer and stuff like that you know, people might know the name and they might know some of the more popular songs, but, you know, to like get into the really deep, the weird stuff. Yeah. You know, look at our album, people always, they're like, what are the, your favorite songs on there? So now in my old age, I'm finding that the, the more prog songs are like my favorite. So like Necromancer and Wasape, you know, the right. weird stuff is like my favorite. And like, I get the, like what you're saying with Tomorrow Will Come and the more accessible or poppy stuff but for me you know if if it was me and, and we we would have to pick any songs that we would play to get up there i would just play the weirdest songs that we have. <laughs> so, i get it yeah <laughs> yep, i i totally get that and i'm i'm on board with that and uh you know i was that iron maiden kid as well you know that uh, kiss changed my life of course you know as a kid and i hear that from so many and you know they always get a i think they get a bad rap uh you know, a lot of a lot of times, you know, from the music nerds, they're they're not a legitimate band, and that is so not true. Uh, you know, I I hear that a lot. Uh, so you know, it influences you know guys like yourself to do what you do. Um, you know, and and they were huge for me too, uh, and that's really cool to hear. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a song like Wasabi. I want to cover that too. Uh, this is really, it's one of those weird songs. It's, it's, it's completely different. Now it's, it would, I mean, I would call it if it, if the album had a title track, which it does not, there's not a Beowulf track. Uh, but this would be, this is the centerpiece quite literally. It's in the very smack dab in the middle of the album. Um, some spoken word, uh, and the spoken word I believe is from Beowulf. Uh, mm -hmm. right. So you know, this is the centerpiece. This is the the peak. This is the summit of Everest. When you're, you know, there's the climb, and then you get up there and you look around, uh, and you, and you, you know, go over your achievement. This is what it feels like to me. Uh, where's the inspiration for Wasabi come from? 
I'll tell you this. Yeah, you got it. This is a good one. So on one of those trips down there, it's just me, Corey and Andy. And we're sitting in, you know, the, the control room and, and Andy and I are behind the computer at Pro Tools. And Corey's kind of sitting next to us and he's working on his laptop. He turns around to, to Andy because this is Andy's song. It's his idea. If you if you look at the, the artwork on the album, that's a vision that came to Andy one night in his dream. And he got up and he sketched it out. He actually has the sketch. He sent the sketch to our artist, Rainer. And Rainer drew what you see on the album from Andy's sketch. So Corey turns around and says to Andy, he's like, what exactly does this even mean? And so he starts talking. He starts telling him what, what the song means to him. And Corey goes, you're talking about Beowulf. And he, and he types it in. And he starts reading Beowulf to me and Andy. And we're like looking at each other like, you know, a couple of schoolgirls. You know, we're like, we go and we're like, this is absolutely, it's genius. It's, you know, and I was like, oh my God. And then Corey's like, we should have Steve speak this in, in like the original language. And, and then we're all like, wait a minute, you know? And then it, like you said, it just became bigger than life, you know, just like that. And that's how Corey does stuff. The joke is, don't ever tell Corey anything because if you come back tomorrow, it's going to be a song, right? <laughs> or if Corey gets really quiet for a few minutes, you know, it, somebody will say something in the car, you know, like maybe we should do da da da. And then Corey won't say anything for like three or four minutes. And then he'll turn around and he'll be like, and it's an idea. And, right. and wow. that's exactly what happened. And that's how Wasape happened. It was just in a matter of a couple minutes. <laughs> Unbelievable. Like, Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, and, and wasape, uh, if I'm clear on it, uh, means bear uh, in, in a Native American language, um, which is on the cover. Uh, that was the vision, uh, you know, a part um, of the vision. Yeah, in the in the Native American, what you know, is translated as like I'm a man. So in the whole, yeah, it all ties together. And I'm not smart enough to know all that stuff, but I trust Corey because I know he's smart enough. To <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I read Beowulf as a freshman in high school. So I, I kind of, you know, I remember it's an ancient text with an, un, you know, there's no known author. Uh, it's a found text, almost like, I don't want to say the Bible, but, you know, it's very much in that vein. Uh, so it, that is intriguing to me right off the bat. Uh, you know, that, that whole concept of Beowulf uh, and then I heard the song and I was like wow this is just it's so powerful it's really not everybody will get it you know right I mean I will tell you we've had a, it's probably the biggest response of any song that we've had on the CD now one of my daughters is actually in college and I'll tell you that she played it for all of her friends they get it and what we've what we found from when we play live is uh, that that older high school, younger, or even college age, not even to say younger college age, but but the kids that are, you know, in college, they, I, I don't know if they're, I, I feel like they're, they're needing and are wanting something more than what mainstream music media is cramming down their throat. Uh -huh. So the kids she goes to the school with are very diverse. There's, um, you know, kids from India there, kids from Asia there. Her school has a very, diverse population and they all they all get it and they're all they talk about it and you know she relays that back to me is like man dad the kids they just they're just floored by it you know and I think they're starved for something that's not them being told what they should be listening to you know what I mean and it's like and I I, I really feel like we're that you know and we're something different where, where we like pull from our influences, but we're modern and new, kind of and fresh, you know, something not mainstream and not, you know, not the norm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no. you know, I, I was thinking, you, you know, you haven't, nobody's heard wasabi before. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is a, uh, when you hear it, it'll be the first time you've heard something like that uh, for sure. Yeah. If you like it or don't like it, it's regardless, uh, you may get it. You may not get it. But it will be something that you haven't heard before. Promise. <laughs> and that, I, I think that's good. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, to challenge yeah. their mind a little bit and make you think. Maybe it'll force them to go pick up a book 
like you said, and read Beowulf, or maybe it'll it'll force them to look, look up what it means, you know, and that's kind of what we've, Corey and I and Andy have had this conversation before. It, you'll put a song out there and it, it might mean something to you, but it might not mean the same thing to me. It might mean something else to me. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, and that's nothing wrong with any of that music you have behind you. That, that record might mean something to you and it might mean totally something different to me. And that's great. And that's why as a writer and an artist, you do that, you know, to invoke some thought, you know, in, in, in people and, and make them, you know, I don't know, take them out of their every day, nine to five a little bit and take them someplace else and hopefully take them on that musical journey and maybe inspire them to do something they wouldn't have done before. You know? Yeah. Hey, Amen. Yeah. That. That's, that's, a, that's a great thing. That's, I love that. I love the musical journey. I love going to places that I haven't been. Uh, it, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, tell me about the gear you play on Beowulf. Uh, you know, I do, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing things. I, you know, is this four string, five string, fretless, uh, Chapman stick? Uh, you know, no. <laughs> it's what? I play. I use Robert's basses. So, okay. Because- so I'm going to name drop here a little bit. I'm about to nerd out. Okay. So I get out. Okay, he's got like rooms full of bases, right? But I used a, a, on every album, I've used the same four string Steinberger that he had when he played with Sammy Hagar. And it's red. And it is, I mean, I've owned like a, a bazillion bases. And out of every bass I've ever played, that's the bass. If I, if I could have one instrument, and nothing else ever again. And I've had my own Steinbergers. They just, that's just, it just sounds the best, right? And so uh, then he had a four string jazz bass that he uses when he plays with Greg Kinn. Um, I had a five string Washburn that he had that Sammy Hagar actually gave him. He had the neck replaced. He had somebody make a, uh, a graphite neck to put on there. And then he also played a five string Steinberger that he had bought for the last um, when he did the 3.2 tour and he had to get some gear to go out. That black bass that you see, that five, and he's like, in, I play that one on the album too. So I, on the first albums, I only used the red Steinberger, but on this album, I used four different basses, believe it or not. They, they were there. And, and what would happen would be he would be, uh, I got a little funny side story to tell you off of that too, but. Um, just, just to, so you can see how like tuned Robert's ear is, but he would, I would start playing a song and he'd be like, no, 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 no. And he goes, that one needs the jazz bass. So we'd switch or, you know, I started playing the jazz and he'd go, wait, 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 wait. He goes, that one's going to need the Steinberg. Oh yeah. So we'd switch back, you know, or something like that. Right. But there was a, when I was playing though, like the day before, he's like, I'm looking for this purple pick. It's, it's, it's triangular. And he goes, I want you to use that pick because it, it has a certain sound. It, we looked up. I mean, there's stuff all over his studio, right? I mean, it would be like if you tried to find a very specific CD right behind. I mean, you know, <laughs> right. I mean, so like, and we're looking for this pick, and nobody can find it. Well, I'm playing the Washburn the next day, and I'm having an incredibly hard time getting the fret to go down. And I'm like, something's wrong with your bass, Robert. And he's like, there's nothing wrong with my bass. And I'm like, it's I can't fret this, and I'm I'm just mashing the crap out of it, right? And then all of a sudden, he looks over and he's like. You know that purple pick that we were looking for yesterday it was in the strings of the bass. He was stuck and he reaches over and he pulls it out and he hands it to me and he goes, "Oh, there it is." <laughs> yeah, I mean that was our reaction too. All of us are sitting in the studio, just like, "Man, you've got to be kidding!" You know, it was great, but that's how that's how my nuke his ear is to the point that he wants you using a certain pick at certain times wow. because it's a certain sound. And that's what he's trying to get across. Even if it's just for a few bars, there, there's a story that Corey tells. There's a little, a Telecaster part in one of the, the songs. And Robert's like, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. And he goes, go over there and climb up on that ladder and get that case down. There's like, there's like a 72 Telecaster in there. Bring that down here. So you bring it down. He tunes it up. Corey like played it for like eight bars. He goes, oh, okay, put it away, put it away. That was it. <laughs> just that part of the song and that was it i mean so you know for the for the songs there's a there's a massive dw kit set up that andy plays Corey has an infinite number of keyboards robert's got keyboards propped up in the corner that don't look like we've touched them for 10 years because there's dust all over you know but 
But if that sound comes through and he needs it, it's there, right? Yeah. Obviously, I use four basses, multiple electric guitars, uh, you know, Paul Reed Smith, you name something, it's there. Uh, Corey used uh, Les Paul. Um, you know, there's Taylor acoustics, there's Takamini acoustics. I mean, 12 string, six string. If, if you can dream it, it's there. You know what I mean? It's Hammond V3 is not a fake Hammond. It's a real Hammond. You know, Love it. It's Hammond that Keith Emerson played on the three album. It's sitting mm. like two feet from you. You know, it's that kind of stuff. You know, it's like uh, when you go out in the room and there's a Mellotron sitting there and like Rick Wakeman signed it because it was Rick Wakeman's Mellotron. You know, it's that. It's like, right. okay. You know, every oh. time you buy something, it's just kind of like, huh. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, it's it's like a musical museum. Yeah, I, mean, I was gonna say it's its own hall of fame right there. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah. yeah. Ah, it, that's great. It's bigger. It's it's larger than life, or you know, you could ever imagine. And just to be to be to be able to even be there, you know, for a day, it's a it's such an honor and a blessing, and it's so humbling, and it's just it's all those things, you know. And I've been there. One, two, three, four, I don't know, five or six times now for a few weeks at a time. And it's just, yeah. I, you know, can, can I live there? Can I move? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you know, and it's got to be inspiring, uh, you know, to a player, you know. Yeah. Yeah, to, to, to be able to play those things and be in that atmosphere is a wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. Um, I got to get to the Reckoning. Uh, 2003 record. We it hasn't been released. Uh, there is a video, uh, cigarette, uh, from the song from the album. Will we ever get that album? Uh, what's the story with with that record? It, so it, you know, it came it came apart. It came about in that downtime, kind of I guess when everybody was, some of us were family and and, and kidding and jobs and you know school and stuff like that. So yes, uh, there, there's there's always the possibility that's going to come out. And, and I've, I've heard people say, is there any more new music coming? And, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to open my mouth and stick my foot in there. But like I said before, uh, there's Corey's always got stuff. He's always writing. The last time we were down there, he's like, Hey, uh, I got a riff, you know? And I'm like, well, Hey man, I got a riff. So I take my iPhone out, play something on my bass and record it, played it for him. So he comes over and now he's recording me play the riff and stuff. So yes, things are, is there going to be other stuff? I can, I can almost guarantee there's going to be some other stuff coming. Um, probably awesome. the idea right now, the, uh, on paper is to go back if we're able to in the summer of 2025 and hopefully do something else with Robert again before we all get too old. <laughs> <laughs> but in the, in the short interim of that, you know, we, we've played a couple pretty, pretty good gigs for us here recently. We played in Beaumont, Texas at an art studio, and we played in Muskogee, Oklahoma at the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And that was huge for us. That's when we released Beowulf, and it went really, really well. So, you know, they're like, what's the next steps? So the next steps on that are to practice, obviously, and to play. There, there's a thing in Texas called a swing dance club, and there's a whole bunch of them. And they're located in college towns. So there's about seven of them that we're trying to hit at once. And we want to play like a week or two and just hit these clubs once college starts back up again because the kids don't have anything else to do. So they go there to yeah. hang out. Now, and then where we live in Tulsa, there it, it's hard to play original music is what we're finding. It's hard to play original music in Houston unless you play, unless you play like covers or unless you're a, uh, a um, tribute band. Most people don't want to talk to you, right? Yeah. But we're starting to find places here that will let a mu original music play or like renting small theaters on our own so we can string like two or three nights together in Tulsa, in Beaumont. Beaumont has a Roxy now, and the, oh. the art studio there wants us back. So hopefully two or three nights there, a, a week or two in Texas playing these like swing dance clubs, a few, a few shows in Tulsa playing like some clubs that let us play original music, and then the idea after that is after we get some shows and get our feet wet a little more is to try next year to hit prog festivals like prog stock, American prog festivals, even if we can get overseas and play some. I mean, I, I personally think that if that crowd 
the people that like us, like yourself, you know, the people that, that dig this kind of stuff could see us play something like that. You know, even if it's at noon on a Sunday and we open up for 20 other bands, you know, or something like that yep. to be, to, to get to people to be like, who's this, you know, and, and yep. to see it to be like, and we've had not to say, you know, before when we did the first three albums, we had, we had a level of success and, you know, Corey and I have yep. talked about this. We feel like we've hit that level of success already where we're at now. And we're, you know, beyond that, we've had the Dutch progressive rock page is, is like really promoting us huge. You know, last week, Corey was telling me he had some guy in like New Zealand contact us and buy, buy some CDs and like, man, I've been waiting for this for 20 years. And it, it's like, we, you know, and we hear that a lot. Where have you guys been, you know, for 20 years? And, and it's like, we, we didn't think that people would remember, you know, and, and we're very, we're very blessed and fortunate that they did. And, you know, we, but we're, we're very lucky last, you know, before it, it was Andy and I stuffing CDs or cassette tapes in envelopes and going to the post office and mailing all this kind of stuff out. And hopefully somebody would maybe put you in a print magazine, you know, if you're lucky, right? Well, now, now I can sit here on my phone and, yep. and talk to you and, and everybody can see it like that instantly. And, yep. and so we have a lot more, we have a lot more capability, I guess, you know, than, than we, we had 20 years ago. And, and hopefully for us, it's a good thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I wanted to talk about that too. Uh, one thing that people will notice is a lack of the material on the streaming services, Spotify and, and things like that. Uh, right. Where's the band stand with that? And will we see the band more on the streaming services? Yeah, I think, I think actually Corey has put some stuff in there. I'm not ex I'm not a thousand percent sure what he has put on, and what, I know some stuff is on some. If you go to our website Pangea.band, I think there's a link you can get to some of that on there. Um, of course, we have some stuff on YouTube, and, but and all that's linked through our our website. Um, I don't think I'm not exactly sure how all that gets set up. You may know better than me how you know. I don't not sure. I think the in your in the original trying to get all that set up is I'm not sure how we get our, you know, maybe to say like to get our money back or something like that, you know, from, I'm not sure how all that right. monetary sets up and things like that. So that's, that's for people smarter than me to figure out. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. Uh, Way above my pay grade to be honest with you. I'm just the bass player. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that would be, that opens up another world, uh, you know, when you're in related lists and, you know, so somebody that's listening to Yes, when that finishes, they're going to get Pangea yeah. in, their, in their ears uh, right away, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, you know, so there are advantages to that. You, you're not going to sell as many hard copies probably doing that. But, you know, that's, that's it's, a, it's a trade that, you know, it's kind of the future. Uh, it, yeah. Well, and, and I'll tell you, we, we, you know, at our, at our shows, we set up merch and we did, we, we have shirts, obviously, and we have our physical CDs and stuff like that. And, you know, we kind of, you kind of hope you're going to sell X amount. And, and we did, we did really, really, really well. And we're finding that through, through shows like yours, we're getting, we're getting a lot of people buying stuff off the, you know, buying stuff off of our, our webpage. And it's, it's, it's incredibly humbling, you know, that in it's a, uh, it's great. I mean, <laughs> you know, and and we, we don't have any. I might have said this earlier. There's no delusions of grandeur. You know, I don't. I don't think tomorrow we're going to be taking taking this place of the Rolling Stones on tour or anything like that. Right. If we're able to just do this, you know, so that we can provide for our families and not have to work a nine to five. That's that's the idea and that's the goal. You know, is just to be able to to see places we'd never get to see and travel the country, travel the world. And hopefully, you know, just spend some time before and after the show talking to, like this, talking to people, yep. you know, sitting down with somebody in a coffee shop or something and talking about music. That's the that's the end game, I guess, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, that is. And and that's great. Uh, you know, that's uh, it's a great life experience for sure. Uh, you know, and, and to put this music out into the world, it has a it has a power to it. It has a you know, there is a. Uh, for me, there's a spiritual thing with music. It's it's very, 
you know, especially a song, you know, uh, like Wasabi, uh, you know, it's really, it's powerful stuff. You know, I sit, I listen to it. Um, you know, it's not the background stuff. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, it's actually getting listened to, getting absorbed, getting appreciated. Uh, you know, and I'm not the only one. I know that. Uh, so, you know, we, we you, you're, you're the minstrel of the, the minstrels of the world, and uh, you know it's the soundtrack for for our existence. So, it's it's pretty special stuff, and uh, I am proud proud to get it out there and get it in as many years as I can. Uh, you know, I, I know that people are going to you know I'm going to put Pangea dot band on there. They're going to go. They're going to see that. A lot of people will go to spotify and apple music and you know because that's a thing um and i hope they can find you know something from you uh in in some way uh because people need to hear it thanks there's yeah. a funny thing you said you know about wasapi i was thinking when you said that there uh when we had the rough demo tape when we got it it was like song number nine and whenever i get in my car and put it because my car is so old it actually still has a cd player in it um, <laughs> It, the kid, my kids would be the same. They would say the same thing every time. They would say, "Go to song number nine. and right. that was Wasabe. And so, yeah, it's even my eleven-year-old daughter. Right, she's starting to play guitar now. I took her this past weekend to the Ghost movie because she's really into Ghost. You know that right. that they put out the live concert video they put out. Yeah. That's her favorite song on the album too. Is, is Wasabe. So I mean, it's a uh, we're right. getting a lot of really good feedback about that song. We really appreciate it. I know Andy appreciate it too. He put a he put a lot of hard work into it. And in the very beginning, here's a, another little bit that you probably might might find interesting yourself is that when he when he very first presented it to us in its infancy, right? Like when it was 900 minutes long, and we had to you know <laughs> to right. up it. He said, "I'm going for a Genesis kind of feel," and we were like, "Huh," you know. So from uh that from that like 30 minutes he had on tape to i want it to sound like genesis that's what you get you know we got it to that to wasabi so i mean it's kind of it's and funny it, to see how things start and where they end up sometimes yeah yeah you know now i mean that has a very peter gabriel era you know come out with the big costume mask thing uh it is it is that uh it's something you haven't heard it's it's experimental maybe you could call it uh progressive it, by definition progressive uh it goes somewhere it's it, it goes to a realm that you haven't been and uh i appreciate that man i really appreciate that and i also you know i appreciate songs like tomorrow will come uh where you do that and then you do wasabi and you do everything in between uh it's a great journey it really is i appreciate what you do well we appreciate you thank you so much we appreciate the time and, and all the effort you put into it yeah, yeah, I can't wait to tell people about it. Uh, Ron Polson, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, come back and uh, and see me when you know when the big tour happens, and uh, you know I get the word out, and uh, you know maybe cruise to the edge, uh, things like that. Where uh, you know big festivals, I'm more than happy to 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 promote that. Thanks for everything. Yeah, you got it, man. Ron, thank you. Uh, yeah, I will talk to you soon. Okay, have a good day. Thanks. Be well. All right. Bye bye.